Hello everybody, welcome to Uproar, presented by TheMainland.com. This is just another way to get you guys some content. We're, you know, we write a lot of stuff for the site, but not everything can be just written out. Some of this stuff needs to, to be presented in other ways, and this is our way of doing it. By the way, why don't we go around the room here and introduce ourselves. I'm Michael Citro. I'm Andrew Harrison. I'm Austin David. I'm Andrew Marcinko. And we got a lot to cover, so uh, why don't we just jump right into it. We're going to talk about the preseason a little bit. Andrew M., let me start with you. What are, what are your thoughts about the preseason so far? What have we seen out of Orlando City? Absolutely. Well, we just finished up what was a bit of a tough run in the Carolina Challenge Cup up in Charleston, South Carolina. Ended up, frankly, last place in that tournament. We uh, managed to tie New York in the opening match. Also tied Charleston, and it ended up being only a 26-minute match that was shortened by bad weather. And then, obviously, a lot of people saw the really rough final match against the Houston Dynamo, where there were two red cards for Orlando City. They finished the match with nine men and lost three to nothing. Yeah, I don't think we can take a whole lot out of these uh, last two games, can we? No, I don't think we really can. I think the 26 minutes really didn't give us any chance to really get going, and I don't think we even tried to get going in those 26 minutes we played. Um, I think the last game showed us what it's actually going to be like when it comes to opening day. We're going to get pressured. We're going to really get an introduction into MLS. Austin, you got any thoughts about the, what you've seen in preseason so far? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that Houston game was definitely Orlando's welcome to MLS moment. Um, you know, the New York City t uh, game, the first game, they're a new team as well, so uh, they haven't really experienced what the league is about just yet. Um, so I think that Houston game is, is a good test for Orlando, uh, you know, putting them back on their heels and seeing how they, how they react to it. And now that they know, they can go forward and hopefully come March 8th, they can make strides and, and win the game. Well, you know, that game against Houston, I think, taught us a little bit about what we are seeing out of our back line, and we're not really all liking what we're seeing, are we? No, I think what we're seeing is not good heading into that first opening game. Um, we're just seeing a lot of mistakes right off the bat. We're still seeing a lot of changes going in. Um, we have got a lot of positional play still to do. I think Ramos has been our bright spark in that back place. We've got Shea who's going, but we still don't know where his position's going to be. we still got a lot of choices to make in that position. And it's not at all unexpected, though, to be fair. I mean, this is an incredibly inexperienced back line. Just we knew that going in. This will be Ramos' first, um, uh, first league match when the, he opens the MLS season, if he starts it right back. Breck Shea is a converted attacking midfielder, more or less. Colin, obviously an MLS veteran in the middle. And then it's been sort of a carousel at the other uh, center back spot, mostly recently between St. Ledger and uh, Seb Hines. So it's not, not necessarily unpredicted that we're struggling a little bit back there. Yeah, we really haven't had a, a chance to see these guys gel yet. Colin was a little bit injured earlier, and it, it just uh, we're not really seeing what we're going to see, I think, uh, you know, maybe three, four games into the MLS season, are we? I think time's going to take, it's going to always take time. Every time a new player comes in, we want it, we do have a system that we want to play, but we are trying to restructure our entire back line. Um, we did have some young kids that played for us last year that have not seen any time this preseason. Um, we've got to give ourselves a chance to come into our system and find a new style of play that we can play. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you what, the thing I think I'm most concerned about is who we thought was going to be the anchor of that back line, which is Aurelian Collin, mm -hmm. uh, a guy we brought in, a pretty substantial contract. He was a MLS Cup MVP a couple of years back, I think, for Sporting KC. But he struggled so far this preseason. He struggled a little bit in the end of last season for, for Sporting Kansas City as well. Um, got beat on the goal versus New York in the first match of the CCC. And then he earned a red card and gave up a penalty kick in the final match against Houston. So I'm starting to question the guy who's supposed to be the anchor of that back line for us. How much of this is, uh, is Adrian Heath not providing a, a suitable partner for him in, in the central you know, defense? What do you think, Austin? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think the central defense, it's, they had a plan in place going into the season. They had Heath Pierce, uh, who didn't sign because of uh, monetary issues. They had Paulo Andre, who again, monetary issues, they couldn't come to a deal. And they had Gustavo, who just didn't work out in the end uh, for various reasons. So they had th three different plans in place, and it just didn't work out for them. So they're kind of struggling to try and, and figure out what they're going to do now. So it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a tough, 
place well, to and, be. And when you jump back to, to Collins, who at SKC, he had Matt Beasler, uh, famous in the World Cup this mm -hmm. summer, next to him in the center back mm -hmm. position. And then Chance Myers, a really solid MLS fullback, was, was paired next to him on the wing. He doesn't have that kind of consistency and, and frankly, that kind of talent right now. So that might be a little bit of the problem as well. Andrew, what do you think? Did we did we miss the boat a little bit in the expansion draft and the Chivas USA dispersal draft that may be providing some depth there at I, center back? I certainly agree we did. I think we missed some major pickups that we could have had. I think David Horst was playing in the Houston game. He could have really given us some solid MLS experience taking into that opening weekend. Um, it's really something that we're sadly lacking right now. And going back to Heath as, you know, he had options going in. Maybe they took that risk and that risk's not really paid off. Well, you know, we could talk about uh, the defense for a little bit longer, but why don't we shift gears a little bit and talk about what we think is really working, and that's the, the, the really great chemistry that's developing between Kaká and Kevin Molino, a guy that we all know very well as Orlando City fans. What, is, uh, what are you seeing from those two? I think we're seeing some excellent things. We didn't think this was going to happen this quickly, and we're seeing some great link-up play. They seem to be reading each other really, really well. Um, and they're both making those runs that they both need to be doing, and they both have great vision going in through the center of the park. I think it's great. Sure, and we, we were able to cover the, the matchup versus BK Hacken, the, the Swedish side that was a media-only friendly, and we saw a great play. Kaká beat his man into the box, sent a hard low cross right through the middle. Molina was right there to touch it home. Oh. A lot of Orlando City fans would love to hear Kaká to Molino goal a lot this season. Right, and I, I honestly thought those guys have been looked like they've been playing together for years. They've really been linking up well in, in multiple games. Uh, that's mm -hmm. that's uh, proven out with Kaká having two goals, three assists, and Molino also getting on the score sheet. So we're seeing a lot of good positives out of them. What else are we seeing positive-wise out of our team uh, in the preseason so far, Austin? Well, I think that entire right-hand side is, is really clicking well. Um, I think... Kaká and Ramos kind of, I think Kaká has kind of taken Ramos under his wing a little bit. You see him kind of celebrating with, uh, with Ramos every time he scores and kind of mentoring him a little bit. Um, so I think that whole right-hand side, including Amobi Akugo on the defensive mid-side, I think that entire side works well together, and I think that's a really big positive. All right, well, I think Amobi Akugo has been another positive uh, as well. He's linking the, the back line with the attacking midfield, and, and that's all, all gone very well. Um, but, you know, we have a lot more to cover. We're going to talk about a little bit about the supporters groups because the supporters groups are doing something a little bit different this year. We're going to have the Iron Lion Firm and the Ruckus uh, next to each other in the Citrus Bowl, and they're going to be forming the wall and creating a lot of havoc for uh, our opponents and really supporting our, our, you know, Lions, and they're going to have, a, 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 I think, a profound impact on the game. Well, I've been extremely impressed with the supporters of the Orlando City Lions. Uh, they are some enthusiastic fans. I have to say I'm so excited that they're coming together for the wall. Um, but I recognize that there are, everyone, everyone celebrates in different ways. I'm from England, so I've seen a supporter culture that I am uh, very happy is not here, and I hope it never will be. I don't know, it, it's heartwarming because when you're at a game and you're watching the fan base, they're just crazy. They're just flat out crazy. The city! You and then when you find out that there's another side to them that cares as much about the community as they care about the game of soccer, it's just very heartwarming. The two groups are slightly different, but we come together as the wall now, as one giant supporters group. Hey, we're, we're all good. family, brother. Yes, sir. We're all yes, sir. family. The kids just here? Just, go out. I mean, the rest, hey, not just me, but everybody's here. Everybody's here. Not everybody. Everybody's here. Everybody's here. Everybody's here. Everybody's here. I feel like the first year, um, you know, when, when the team showed up, you had a collective of people who at the time were known as Orlando Soccer Supporters, and it was really just the initial spark of supporter culture. Four years ago, Philadelphia Union, Orlando City preseason at the Ruckus Tree right behind you. We got together as eight of us eating hamburgers, and now, you know, there'll be 400 plus in the uh, Ruckus, and I think they have 400 members of the ILF. So we're near a thousand and we haven't come uh, to the first game of the season yet. We're definitely family. We're the wall now. It's not ILF and Ruckus, we are the wall. 
if you had Ruckus on one end and you had the ILF on the other, over time we would just grow ex exponentially and become one huge group. And, and that's what you have now with the wall. You have two separate passionate groups that can unite in one voice and just wreak havoc throughout the league and throughout the world, hopefully. It's really key for me, and I'm proud to be a fan of Orlando City, not just for the Ruckers, but to stand by, side by side with the ILF and other groups is fantastic. We just want that participation, and, and we might look intimidating, but we're a lot friendlier than you might think, if you're wearing purple. I, we, Phil and I are known for <laughs> sneaking out of... <laughs> <laughs> sneaking out of the owner's um, suite and coming down and standing on the end with the supporters. And it's always the best fun, it's always the best part of the game. Well guys, you know we're not quite done with the USL yet, even though Orlando City's not playing in USL, and it's not USL Pro, it's just USL. We still have an affiliate up in Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, and it's Louisville City FC. And here to talk to us a little bit about that, uh, we're going to bring in our correspondent from Louisville, Jeff Milby, who uh, writes our weekly updates. Jeff, give us a little bit of uh, insight as to what's going on up there in uh, Louisville. Well, it's preseason right now. Um, they've missed two games had scheduled. They've been canceled because of weather. We've had um, about a foot and a half of snow, so the fields were unplayable. Um, but they're also still signing players, 13 players right now signed. Um, the next opportunity for them to play will be on Tuesday. They'll play at Indiana University in Bloomington um, at 3 o'clock. So that's preseason. Uh, Jeff, are you excited about the signing of Brian Burke? Uh, he played in the Orlando City system before. He's played with O'Connor. He's played with under Coach Heath's system. Are the uh, front office at Louisville happy about his signing? Yeah, they were really excited when they, could bring, when they brought him in. Um, they saw it as a, he's a major league soccer talent in their eyes, um, and they really don't expect him to stick around too long, uh, frankly. Um, but yeah, he has familiarity with, with Coach. I played with him, obviously. Um, he uh, knows the system, um, and uh, the expectations are pretty high for him up here. Hey, Jeff. Andrew here. Um, so we know the story of Orlando City making their way from USL to Major League Soccer. Um, what do people down in Louisville think of that? They have a great supporters group in the Coopers that have been very vocal on Twitter. There's a Louisville's MLS Twitter account. What's the vibe down there as far as whether they can ever make their way to Major League Soccer and follow in the footsteps of Orlando City? Well, I, I think people up here are pretty optimistic about it, um, especially within the soccer community, meaning like the Coopers and the team itself. Um, we're... Last I heard, we were second in the league in season tickets sold behind Sacramento. Um, so that's pretty, uh, you know, a good number to have or a good statistic to have. Um, the big question for me is whether or not outside of the soccer community, if we can get the mainstream sports fan in Louisville, Kentucky to pay attention to the team. Um, and I think that may be the biggest question for long-term success for the team because um, it, there's, there's a question as to whether people are taking it seriously, both because it's a, a lower division team and because it's soccer in general. But um, as far as the team itself goes, they are uh, planning for MLS. That's their goal. That's their expectation. That's what they want. And um, they're not at all expecting this to go poorly. They think it'll go really well. And as, like I said, second in the league in season tickets, it is going pretty well so far. Now, Jeff, um, Austin here. Um, you guys have got, uh, you know, that you guys are building the roster. You got a lot of midfielders. Uh, you got one forward and Matt Fondy, um, but there's still a lot to to be, you know, brought in and whatnot. But uh, because of the affiliation with Orlando, you're going to be getting some guys coming down from the MLS squad. Uh, have you got a chance to look at the roster at all and see who you personally might want to come down or come up to Louisville? Well, uh, I would be really excited if Kyle Aaron could come up. Obviously, I mean, first overall pick, really talented. And there's a need at his position on the roster. We only have one forward, um, so he could definitely get some playing time up here. Um, past that, uh, you know, we, you've talked about on, on the blog, you've talked about uh, Harrison Heath potential there. I think that would be exciting, especially considering, um, you know, he's the coach's kid, so that would be neat. Um, but really, just in general, and, and we need a goalkeeper, so I think maybe Edwards could come up, come up too. Um, but really, in general, I think 
uh, the Orlando guys, um, I'm excited about whoever Louisville will get because they're going to infuse some talent into the team, and that's always welcomed. Jeff, let me ask you about these uh, cancellations due to the weather. Is that setting the team back, do you think? Do you think they're going to be able to, uh, to have a productive preseason, uh, you know, like some of the USL teams that are not dealing with these uh, weather issues? I think it definitely sets them back because they've been uh, practicing. Like the first week of practice was at an indoor soccer facility, like on AstroTurf where they were wearing sneakers. Um, it, it wasn't good. Um, now they're playing across the river in Indiana at a, at a, a more capable facility with field turf. Um, but it definitely sets them back because they're not capable, they're not able to put a full team out on the field when they practice. It's a confined space, walls. There's not full regulation goals that they're using. Um, so it's definitely a, a, a setback. Whether that means they'll be you know, worse off to start the season, I can't say. But it's definitely not ideal at this point. Well, Jeff, uh, you know, we're going to be looking for more and more updates from you as we go along. We're going to uh, we're going to certainly make sure that any Orlando City players that are on loan to Louisville uh, are getting a lot of ink. Uh, meta, you know, not the, the that you have ink on the internet, but uh, you know the internet equivalent of ink. We're going to be getting a lot more of that from you as the season goes on. Uh, one last question before we let you go is. Um, you know, how is the baseball stadium fitted for soccer that the, that the team's going to be playing in? And, you know, are there any lingering issues or, or anything like the, you know, the warning track and the, and the pitcher's mount and that kind of thing? Is that all getting taken care of? They, uh, they just released um, their plans for the, uh, the pitcher's mound. It's going to be a retractable system using a corkscrew. Like, it's, it's not going to be hydraulic. Um, so it's pretty unique. They were excited about it. Cost, I think, $165,000 was the number. Um, but they're shipping that in now, and they're gonna—they were supposed to install it this weekend. Um, but as far as the turf goes, that is going to be a problem. And I've talked to O'Connor about it, and he was concerned because the infield and the, and the warning tracks—they're supposed to use a special turf. They haven't announced what that special turf is, um, but they're going to have it. And it's definitely not ideal to have multiple surfaces on your field. Also, the dimensions of the field aren't ideal. It's going to be a little short and kind of fat. Um, and O'Connor didn't really like that when I talked to him, but it's, it's definitely the best place for them to play as far as the stadium is. So they sort of have to make do with, with, with the field because it's, it's the only reasonable, as far as a business goes and getting fans excited about it, it's the only place they can really play. So is it ideal? No. Um, could it be better? Maybe, but it's what they have to do. All right, well, Jeff Milby, our Louisville City FC correspondent, thanks so much for giving us the lowdown on our USL affiliate. Well, thanks for having me. So Orlando City and Louisville, we talked a little bit about guys who might be going up there, Harrison Heath, some of the young uh, folks that we have on the team. I think we're going to send a goalkeeper up. And, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think right now Orlando has six people up in the forward position. I think we usually typically play one up front. We're not likely to see that change right now. I think Louisville's got to take some forwards. I'm probably going to say it's going to be Laren just for that competitive playing time. He played well in college. He wants to stay fresh. And if we need help later on in the season, he's going to be ready to go. And we know we have a lot of midfielders down in Louisville already, but you have to think that Harrison Heath and probably Estrella as well might be headed down there too. Okay. Well, you know, we've talked about Orlando City. We've talked about Louisville City. And uh, now we're going to talk about another team that's here in town, the Orlando City Foundation. Foundation started um, really way back when we were in Austin. Um, we, when we first started the team, we wrote into our players' contracts that they had to do 28 hours of community service at our direction. Um, and then when we moved here, we wanted to continue that outreach into the community. So same thing, we wrote it into the contracts. And really, that's how the foundation was born. We sat down and, and said, well, this is something we need to do. So it's two years now, I think, the foundation has been, been up and running. They really wanted to be community partners. Um, Kay has been outstanding. She, she kind of strikes me as like the first lady of soccer here in Orlando. All of our members know that if they ever 
have the need to help anyone or to do anything, we have an army in ourselves that we're willing to point wherever Kay Rawlins needs and whatever the foundation needs to do. They rolled up their sleeves and really in, ingrained themselves into the community. I personally have a lot invested with the foundation. I love everything that they're doing for the community. And I think that's a huge important thing um, because soccer is about your community, at least professionally. And that's actually one of the reasons why I, I fell in love with the team initially. They said it was for the city of Orlando. It wasn't for the sponsors or anything like that. It was for the people who live here who are gonna support here. The, the work the foundation does um, and anything that they might do, we have so many members who are always willing to answer the call for anything they might need. Any extra pair of hands that they need, we're willing to give. But it's always been, it's, it's, it's one team, it's one project, it's, it's one stadium, it's one fan group, it's one community. That's pretty much the way we do here, things here in Central Florida. I believe that the Orlando City Soccer Foundation will be an integral part of our community for as long as the team is here, and I expect that to be um, for a very long time. All right, so before we give our final thoughts here on this uh, first ever edition of Uproar, we've got to talk a little bit about the left side, guys. Not only left midfield, but left back. We've got uh, two schools of thought at left back. Some people say Breck Shea, you know, keep, keep him in there. Some people say Luke Bowden's the man there. And at left mid, we've had a little bit of a mess because, you know, we've had some injuries. Carlos Rivas was, was hurt and missed some training with his shoulder. And, uh, you know, we've seen a number of guys there, Louis Neal and uh, Eric Avila. And, uh, you know, what do you guys think we're going to do about that left side? Well, you know, like you said, there's a lot of options. Breck Shea has pretty much started every preseason match at the left back role, which mm -hmm. is more or less new to him. I know he's played it here or there, but was primarily an attacking midfield player uh, while he was in England and before that in MLS as well. Uh, we do have Bowden waiting there, who was a great player for us in USL for a number of years. On the left mid, though, Lewis Neal has started most of the matches, an MLS vet, but also spent years in the championship in England with Stoke and a number of other clubs. So a solid option there as well, a veteran experienced player who's started a lot of matches for us at the left mid this preseason. Uh, I think a left back, I got to say it's going to be Luke Bowden. I think he gave us so many minutes last year. Um, he's had that experience in the championship from his time before he ever came to Austin and Orlando City. Um, I know Shea has started there a lot, um, but really his best times were when he was playing that left wing role. He's, I know he's had a solid performance in the preseason, but we have such a shaky defense. Bowden knows the system. Um, he's not having to le relearn his job, which was really what we're asking Bowden to do. Um, and on the left wing, I going to say we're probably going to see Rivas there when he actually makes the cut and um, he actually recovers from injury and gets going. I wouldn't expect I'd expect to see Lewis Neal start the opening day, though. No, but you say, Breck Shea has played well this preseason, though. We've had issues. We've, we've had a, you know, defense has been weak. We talked about the backline concerns. I thought Breck Shea has been more or less a bright spot. On top of that, he brings a lot of attack to left back, more so than Bowden. Bowden's a good player. He might be a little more solid defensively, but Breck Shea has elite speed, truly elite speed. And at the fullback spot, when you can get forward and attack, you're doing more for your team defensively by taking the game to the opponent. Has he really shown us that elite speed, though, uh, in the preseason? I don't think he's shown us that elite speed. And when we've actually got the frailties, one part of the corner of a wall doesn't make it a wall. Um, we've still got many more places that people can shoot through. I still feel like we have to get that bit where if we can pull people and keep the pitch really wide, um, Shea offers us that. He can show us that elite speed. And he actually did show us that a little bit. But when he was playing the forward role for his goals, that's when he goes that cut in and he actually accelerates. He's not really showing that on his track backs when he's actually got to get the ball behind him. Um, Bowden showed us that last season. I feel like as a fan, I want to see those kind of minutes come from somebody who's actually shown that commitment, is willing to track back, and actually spends a lot of time playing defense. We have to be safe on both sides of the ball. We've got to score goals, but we've got to stop those goals happening too. Well, I think there's talent we want in at left mid, though, because Lewis Neal is a good player. He was a very good player for D.C. United last year, started a lot of matches for a very good D.C. club. Obviously, he's got the English experience under his belt as well. On a fairly young team, I think it shouldn't be understated the value of his veteran presence in the midfield to sort of tie things together for Orlando. I really liked Neal's draft pick. I thought it was a great pick by us. We brought somebody who knew the system, got some MLS recent experience, and was playing in a position that we weren't going to need.
Um, we talk about experience. We already have a lot of people with experience, though. Kaká's been playing for 15 years. We've got Molina, who's played in our system. Maybe it will be time in the short period. Neil's probably a good choice, but I think Rivas has to pick up that spot when he gets fit and healthy and is going to be the only one if we don't move Shea. I still want to see Shea in that spot, making those in-road cuts, showing what he showed at FC Dallas that got him well, to the you, English Premier League in the first place. You mentioned a good name there, Carlos Rivas there. Where does he fit in if Breck Shea moves up to the left mid? Rivas, a great young player, led Deportivo Cali in goals last season. Um, seems to be one of the fastest players in the MLS. Can we keep him on the bench for that long if Shea moves up to the midfield? Yeah, it really comes down to who gives you the best 11 on the field, right? The, your left side. Austin, what are your thoughts? Are you going to break this tie? Well, I think in order like, to start off the season, it's important for the guys who know the system to get playing time and you know, get everyone else kind of comfortable with the system in itself. Because what we're seeing right now is a learning curve. And a lot of the new guys that are coming in and learning their positions, you know, with Brexley learning his position especially, and then learning the system that Adrian Heath has spent so many years cultivating, I think there's a definite learning curve that really needs to, uh, for, for the, the guys who have been there for a long time, even with Lewis Neal, who's, who's just come back right into it. And, you know, Coach Heath has said he's just come right back in and it's like he never left. But I think it's important to start off with for those guys, you know, Bowden and Neil, uh, to show the new guys, you know, what it's like to play in this system and how it actually can work to their advantage and work very well. So I think in the beginning, I'd like to see Bowden and Neil starting off, to be honest. Um, but I think eventually you'll probably see Shea and Riva starting on that left side. Well, Breck Shea is a guy, you know, we brought in. He needs to be on the field. He was a big-time signing for Orlando. He needs to be on the pitch somewhere most every match. Now, who else are you going to pair with him? Me, I'd take Neil or Rivas over Bowden if you have to put one other person on the pitch with him. I think the Rivas signing is a good signing for us. I love that he's getting those types of goals. Um, I would like to see him using a super sub situation. If he's the fastest man on the pitch, I want to put him on when everybody else is tired. And we also saw some of the frailties for him. Maybe his, his reaction in the uh, Houston game was a little bit something that we don't want to get because he's young and it's not somebody we really want to put all of our stock in right now. Okay, well, you know what? I think in the end, in Inchi, we trust. We'll see what he does, how he gets his best 11 on the field. But before we get out of here, let's do some uh, predictions. we got 60,000 people are going to fill that Citrus Bowl for the first game against New York City FC. Uh, guys, what's going to happen? Uh, I'm going to say it's going to be 1-1. I think we're going to see a repeat of that first game that we played out in Charleston. Um, I think it's going to be a tight, cagey affair. It's going to be a lot of hard knocks. Both teams aren't going to want to lose. I see a 1-1 tie ending in the final result. No, I, th I think we might agree on the tie here. Uh, I think it might be a little more high scoring than one to one, though. Uh, we're going to see some nervous teams out there. It's both clubs' first ever Major League Soccer match. Uh, going to be nerves on the pitch. At the same time that we know, we've talked about Orlando has some backline issues. I don't think they can keep New York off the scoreboard. I think they're the better team, however, so I think they're able to score some goals as well. I'm thinking 2 2, maybe even 3 3 for a final score. Well, I've said this for a few months now, and I'm going to stick by it. I'm going to stay 2-1. I've said this since probably November or December. 2-1 uh, with Kaká and Kevin Molino scoring. So we've got a 2-1 win back here. We've got two ties in the front. I'm going to go ahead and say Orlando City wins this one 3-2. I think the back line is going to give up a couple goals, but I think that 60,000 crowd is going to buoy the guys in, in purple on the field. They're going to score some goals for the home team and the home crowd, and we're all going to go home happy with a 3-2 win. I think we can all definitely agree it's going to be a really exciting match on the field, whatever the final score. Absolutely. Well, you know what? Uh, this has been fun, and we plan on bringing you Mainlanders more of these uproar features as we go. Uh, but until next time, I think we're going to call it a day. Uh, we'll see you online, and uh, go, go City! city.